Good morning. Good morning. Whenever Jesus speaks in agricultural terms, we who live in the Central Valley of California, our ears perk up and we say, we get it. We know what he's talking about. Grace to and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference up in Napa Valley with um, a bunch of Lutheran pastors. And we had a free afternoon, so I took four of them, three from Minneapolis, one from South Dakota, out wine tasting. They'd never been wine tasting before. I'd only been wine tasting like maybe once before. <laughs> And uh, we, we sat on the veranda of this one, one winery, looking out over the valley, and our um, host was pouring wines, and one of the guys that I was with asked the host, what, what makes Napa Valley wines so good and so expensive? Well, said the host, said, uh, you're looking at some of the best growing conditions for Cabernet Sauvignon in the world. He said uh, the soil content is just perfect. The weather is ideal. It allows us to grow these grapes so that as they are harvested, they are picked perfectly for an incredible wine. And then he pointed out in the distance, he said, you, you see that tract of land out there? He said that, that runs about $300,000 an acre. And my friends were a gasp. And one of them said, I think the guy from South Dakota, said, well, how, what kind of wine would you get from, say, $10,000 an acre? <laughs> and the guy pouring wine said, communion wine? <laughs> and that we were pastors. I'm so excited about entering into the summer and having our focus for three months on the parables of Jesus, because largely I don't know if I've ever spent that much time working through, thinking about, and then even preaching on these parables. And so this is going to be kind of fun for me, and I'm jazzed about it because, let's be honest, these parables um, are wonderful stories, and they're intended to give us some enlightenment into what the kingdom of God is supposed to be about, but a lot of times they provide a, a lot of vagueness, a lot of grayness as well. So we've got to work through these. They're, they're not necessarily uh, self-evident. There is a, a challenge, which is why these small groups are so deeply important, so that people can talk more about what's going on in the parables of Jesus. Today we start with uh, probably the most well-known of all the parables. This one parable, the sower, the seed, the soil, is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's a wonderful place to begin. Because Jesus goes out walking along the lake shore, sort of like Lake Cahuilla, on a beautiful day like this. And he's on the northern part of the lake, near the town of Capernaum. That's where he grew up. The people there know who he is. They know that he's a good storyteller. And so when word gets around that he's out walking around, everybody comes out to listen to more stories of Jesus. And they know these stories of Jesus are told in everyday language. He doesn't use deep theological language. He, he uses common everyday language. He talks about shepherds and sheep and treasures and pearls and wedding banquets and guests. And when he tells these stories, he has a tendency to exaggerate, to, to push the envelope, so to speak, to capture attention. And the other thing is... Jesus has an incredible sense of humor. And I think sometimes we miss both the exaggeration and the humor in the way that Jesus tells these stories. And generally then, he would finish them and say, now you go figure out what these mean. So on this particular day, the people ask Jesus to tell them a story. So he gets in a boat, because there's so many people, and he begins, once upon a time... There was a sower who went out and sowed some seeds. Now I'm going to kind of depart just a little bit and put this parable more into everyday vernacular to help us even capture more 
the way in which Jesus exaggerated. So, said Jesus, the sower had tomato seeds. And not your everyday tomatoes. No, these were the best of the best. The big, juicy, red tomatoes that command the highest price in the store. And the sower took these seeds and then indiscriminately just threw them, not really caring where they landed. So at this point, you've got to understand, the folks who are listening to the story, they began to chuckle a little bit. I mean, what sort of nut job would go out and just indiscriminately waste seed like that? They had to have been laughing a bit. Jesus went on. Some of the seed fell upon the hard pan, the, the path. And before long, birds came down, ate it, and took off. And some of the seed fell right alongside the path, but in the, the rocky area next to the path. And, uh, well, those plants, they, they grew up, but then they quickly withered because there was no root base to them. And some of the, weed, or some of the seed fell among weeds. And, and these plants grew up. They didn't produce any, any fruit. But some of the seed, Jesus said, some of the seed fell on great soil. And lo and behold, plants grew up and produced 30 tomatoes. Again, people started chucking 30 tomatoes in one plant. That's not all, Jesus said. Other plant produced 60 tomatoes. 60 tomatoes, the people laughed. Impossible. And other tomato plant produced 100 tomatoes. Now the people were losing it. But there had to have been some cogity Central Valley farmer in the group that said, wait a second, Jesus. Tomato plants don't produce 100 or even 60 or even 30. We're lucky to get a dozen out of one tomato plant. And then Jesus said, I want you to go home. Have some lunch. Think about the story. So, did you get the point of the story? Good, because neither did the disciples. <laughs> they had no idea. And so Jesus went on to explain to the disciples the point of the story. This is only once of twice does Jesus give an explanation to the disciples. And I kind of wish he hadn't. The explanation would have taken place in verses 10 through 17, simply following the passage that we just read. And it's not provided for us at all in Mark or Luke, only in Matthew. And I kind of wish either Jesus didn't give the explanation or that Matthew didn't record the explanation. And I'll tell you why. Jesus says to the disciples who are standing there, who have committed themselves to following Jesus, who are embarking upon a journey that was going to challenge them, that they were going to recognize that wherever they went, there were some people who followed Jesus, and there were many people who denied Jesus or walked away from Jesus or had no time for Jesus. And so Jesus tells them the explanation of the story is that there are some people who have faith and there are some people who don't. And that was important for the disciples. Because again, they were facing great opposition. But let's be honest with the further truth of the story of the disciples. How many of them remained faithful? I mean, take that story all the way to the cross, and how many of those disciples were standing there at the cross, still supporting Jesus while he was dying on the cross? Maybe one, maybe John. But the rest of those disciples seemed to have a lack of faith as well. My point is that the explanation that Jesus gives the disciples about the point of the parable may have been important for them to hear, but it may not necessarily be what you and I need to hear. Here is what I understand. The parables of Jesus are intended almost to defy explanation. His parables are meant to make us think, to make us wonder, to draw us in. To have us go home, have lunch, and think more about what is the point of the parable. I mean, when you and I tell stories, our stories have a beginning and a middle and an end, but not the way of Jesus. Have you noticed? Jesus' parables very seldom have a beginning. 
Usually, he launches right into the middle of the story without providing any context, leading us to wonder all sorts of things. Wait a second. What kind of farmer would just indiscriminately waste seed? Wait a second. What happened to the birds that ate the seed on the path? Did it agree with their digestive tract? And then have you noticed? Very seldom did Jesus' parables have a complete ending. Most of the time, he gets to the end of the parable, and you're hanging on the words, and you're wondering what happens next. I mean, 190 tomatoes, that's way too much for one person to eat all together. Does he invite other people over to the house? Does he give some away? Does he end up selling some? Does he can the rest of the tomatoes? Who knows? The truth of the point is that Jesus' parables seldom offer clarification. Usually we're left with more confusion. I mean, if Jesus wanted to use his parables to be effective in describing clearly and cleanly what the point of God's presence in the world was, I think he could have chosen a different way of speaking to his disciples. But here's what I think. Jesus doesn't use parables to entertain us. No. Story by story, Jesus is moving us from a safe, secure world that we think we know about into another world that is strange and unpredictable. We are acknowledging and recognizing something is going on here. It's different. And God is on the loose. So maybe in listening to this parable of Jesus, maybe you are alongside the disciples. You need to hear that some people have faith and some don't. And that's the reason for the seed. But let me offer a different way of listening to this parable. And it's a way that I have been wrestling with now for the better part of the last couple of months. I ask you, who is this story really about? When we try to make it about ourselves, I think we reduce the point of the parable to asking one reflective question. What kind of soil are you? We spend our time thinking about the soil. The injunction that I have heard from other preachers who have preached on this parable is, okay folks, now, you be good soil. And I love to wonder, how exactly does soil become good? How does it rid itself of rocks and thorns? When we read the parable from this perspective, we place ourselves at the center of the parable, and we push the sower to the edge of the parable. But what if this is a story really about the sower, and not so much about the soil? This is a sower unlike any sower you would ever know. A sower who appears not to care much about the value of the seed as he radically, indiscriminately, and wastefully throws it around. There's no strategic plan for optimum growth. There's no falling upon the scientific technology to give the highest yield. This sower is out of control or at least appears to be out of control according to our standards. And I wonder, does this not describe who Jesus is? An out-of-control rabbi who's turned the Jewish world, and our world as well, upside down. Who surrounds himself not with the A-team, but with the leftovers. Who laughs at the silliness of the religious experts, while at the same time caring deeply for the diseased outcasts, who pokes fun at the political heavyweights, but takes seriously the needs of the no-name leftovers. How do you make sense of a God who gives to those who are undeserving? How do you get your mind wrapped around a Messiah who seems, at least by our standards, to dispense grace carelessly and is reckless in who gets his mercy. I would dare say 
that there isn't a person among us today who hasn't at one time or another wondered how it is that Jesus would regard those who are good for nothing, insolent mess ups by giving them forgiveness, especially when they don't even ask for it. But then at times, but then at times in moments of self-reflection and clarity, I see myself as one whose life has reflected hard path soil or rocky areas or thorny patches. I know that within myself, times that faith has been hard, when hope seems to be distant, when stupid words or behaviors have destroyed relationships, and yet the seeds of God's grace and mercy continues to be spoken and given even to me. Or we see it in others, don't we? We see others who have had a history of faith, a life of living out that faith, but who for time in life they walk away from faith. They disregard faith. They don't invest in faith. They appear to show hopelessness. They appear to walk away. And again, yet we see God's mercy continue to be extended upon all. I find it comforting knowing that Jesus never once in the parable says to his disciples, okay guys, time to be good soil. No ground is declared unproductive to this sower. If there is any hope for the soil within our lives, it is that the sower continues to generously provide us grace and mercy. Extravagantly. Promising even in those times and places in our life in which there seems to be no fruit even possible or hopeful, yet God's grace and seeds continue to fall down. Jesus' investment upon his disciples is simply the story upon which we build our lives, recognizing he never gave up on them. And we believe that he will never give up on us either. And we keep working at whatever soil level we are so that we recognize the grace that God is always given. We trust in the promises that God will provide within us plentiful harvests and fruit more wonderful than anything we could ever imagine and most certainly more than we could ever deserve. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. I invite you to rise and share the peace of Christ with those who are here.